Thank you everyone for joining us for this online symposium on state violence. Um, just to give a brief introduction, the impetus for this event for me came from a review project looking specifically at violence against migrants. And it was no surprise during this research to find that violence by the state often goes uncontested, doesn't have a clear pathway of accountability and is legitimized by um, well, what I see is prioritizing state needs or wants over human ones. And this sort of led me to consider where else in international relations theory, we look critically at state violence, whether it can be directly attributed or whether it's indirect. In the current climate of political violence, deconstructing and understanding the role of the state, either abstractly or directly, I think is a useful exercise for reflection on the impact and experience of everyday violence, violent systems and structures, and violence as a political tool. So today we have four brilliant speakers to inspire those conversations and to present their research across the theme of state violence. Dr. Leonie Fleischmann is a senior lecturer in international politics and human rights at City University of London, working on social movements, civil resistance campaigns, and human rights activism. Dr. Jasmine Garni is a senior lecturer in the School of International Relations at St. Andrews University, working on anti-colonial history and political thought and Western empires in the Middle East and Asia. Professor Ty Solomon is based at the University of Glasgow and works on emotions and power and the politics of space and place, adopting micro-political and everyday approaches to understanding international relations. And Dr. Sashi Kumar Sundaram is a lecturer in international politics at City University of London, working on global order and disorder, focusing on status and reputation concerns in global south and critical geopolitics in Sino-Indian rivalry. So I'm really excited to get started. I know this is going to provoke an excellent discussion and plenty of themes and ideas to pursue and take forward. So each speaker is going to present for sort of 12 to 15 minutes. Um, as the audience, you have access to the Q&A function um, and the chat function as well. So you can put questions into that at any point. Um, I recommend using the Q&A function um, if you can. And then after each speaker is presented, we'll have a little bit of time to open the conversation. Um, and so we will draw questions from the online chat, from the Q&A and invite speaker responses. Um, so we're going to start with a slight variation from the listed order. Um, so we'll go Leone first, then Ty, then Sashi, and then Jasmine. Um, so yeah, over to you, Leone. Thank you. Um, great, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, or perhaps good morning, everyone. Um, I just want to say thank you very much to Andrew and the ISA for putting this um, really pertinent and important um, symposium together. I'm looking forward to the discussions we're going to have. So what I'm going to um, discuss and think about is how state violence is institutionalized through the law. Now, it's not a new idea that legal avenues and instruments and institutions, both domestic and international, have legitimized and perpetuated um, state violence. This is quite a common critique, particularly in critical legal studies. But what I wanna look at is those who try to limit state violence through legal avenues. And what I'm going to argue is that unfortunately and inadvertently that those sorts of avenues can legitimize these institutions and therefore contribute or at least normalize state violence. So I'm looking at this in particular reference to international law, how it's translated to the domestic context in relation to the liberal human rights regime. And I'll argue that working through the legal systems to try and combat state violence can actually uphold, normalize, and perpetuate this state violence. So I'm gonna look at this um, in particular through the laws of occupation as they're applied to the Israeli military occupation of the Palestinian territories. Now I'm using this language, it's controversial language, but I'm using it because it is the international definition and because it is helpful in identifying how international law is used to legitimize state violence and how those working through this system can sometimes have the opposite impact than they intended. Now, obviously it's a very difficult time for those who are connected to Israel and Palestine. And I'm not gonna speak to the current events that are happening. My work in this particular context focuses on the West Bank um, and the legal system that operates um, there. 
So what I'm going to do is I'll first explain um, just very briefly some of the positions of critical legal studies and how they can help us understand um, this institutionalization of state violence. And then um, I'm going to provide some examples of how we can see this operating in the context of um, Israel and Palestine and how those working to combat state violence um, can have the effect of legitimizing it. And then I'll conclude with just some implications of what this can maybe tell us, um, both about international law, human rights, activism, and state violence. So for the past um, probably 20 years or so, we've seen a significant critique of international law and a particularly skeptical um, of the conception and practice of human rights as legal norms. So under this regime of liberal legalism, Legal frameworks are supposed to provide avenues for human rights activists to, to secure rights and challenge violation. However, critical legal studies tells us that liberal legalism denies that law itself is a politics. And critical scholars actually argue that the law does not transcend the political, nor does it restrain it. And it actually translates what are wide ranging political questions into very narrowly framed legal questions. And so in doing so, the law doesn't contextualize the human rights violations, doesn't contextualize the victims. Um, it's tried to separate the law from the context in which it operates. So what it does is it fails to address or even see more funda in fundamental issues of social power asymmetries, and so ignores the institutionalized and systemic state violence. And um, human rights scholars often use an iceberg analogy to describe human rights violations and our attempts to combat them. So the visible tip of the iceberg reveals the symptomatic violations such as torture, physical violence, indefinite detention. However, beneath the surface is the less visible systemic violations and denial of human rights as embedded in the structures of society and governance. And if we only focus on the tip of the iceberg, which is what human rights organizations tend to do, it actually diverts attention away from these underlying conditions. So what can happen is that engaging with legal systems can serve to legitimize and perpetuate the underlying structures and thereby contribute to the maintenance of state violence. So human rights activism that's centered on legal avenues, and not all human rights activism is, but those that use those legal avenues can have the unintended effect of reinforcing state violence. So what I'm going to do now is focus the lens on the Israeli military occupation of the Palestinian territories to see in using this legal framing how um, this happens in practice. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail on the intricate laws that govern the situation, um, but um, to know that according to international law, the laws of occupation govern um, the territory that we can call the West Bank. And these laws are drawn from um, the laws of international armed conflict, the Hague Regulations, Fourth Geneva Conventions, and they also draw from international humanitarian law and international human rights law. Now, even though Israel rejects the definition, it does draw on some of these provisions in its own domestic law. And the idea behind these laws is um, to protect those living under occupation and to determine the, obli determine the obligations of the occupying force. Now, certain clauses within the laws recognize the legitimacy of the occupying force to protect its own security against what is likely to be a hostile population. So what we see these laws do is um, the rights of the occupied population are balanced against the security of the occupying population. And it's actually the um, occupying force that has the authority to make the judgments of whether an act is a security um, necessity. So the consequence of applying international humanitarian law and international human rights law to this context is that it can actually allow for certain violations of rights to be justified in the eyes of the law. Now, an example of this is um, administrative detention. So this is where a person is held without trial and without knowingly having committed a crime on the presumption that they intend to break the law in the future. Now, whilst Israeli laws contain provisions to protect detainees and limit the use of administrative detention to only extreme circumstances, it has been used extensively by the Israeli forces. And the high numbers of administrative detainees 
can in part be explained by the powers granted to the military commanders by Israeli law to modify military orders relating to administrative detention for military necessity. Now, international human rights law allows for some limited use of administrative detention for imperative reasons of security. So arguably, this is following international law. So the detention of Palestinians can be legitimized despite the violation it causes to their rights, um, such as the right to fair trial as one example. And there's many other examples of how the violations of rights are justified in the name of security, using the law to make these justifications. Now, the kind of second step to this is that if the state and the military require approval from the courts to um, justify their actions, this also creates the possibility for opposing these practices through legal avenues. And so a large part of the work of the human rights organizations in Israel and Palestine has been to litigate against the human rights violations. So they file petitions to the High Court of Justice against things like house um, evictions, house demolitions, um, family unification, using the law to try and secure their rights. Now, we see some, most of the time, the um, ruling doesn't go to the claimants, but in some cases, the High Court of Justice does rule in favor of the Palestinian claimants. But an unintended consequence is a rubber stamping of discriminating practice, such that, again, human rights are legitimized. So I'll just give you a quick example of um, how that operated in practice. So there's a highway that runs between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv, and it runs through the occupied Palestinian territories. It runs through the West Bank. And during the second intifada, Palestinian drivers were not allowed to use the road because Israeli authorities claimed to need to make it safe for Israeli traffic. So it became segregated road. And the case was taken to the Israeli High Court of Justice on the basis of discrimination. And the court ruled in favor of the Palestinian claimants and the military commander was not authorized to ban travel to Palestinians on the highway. Now, some deem this a victory for the claimants saying, look, legal avenues work to protect rights of Palestinians. However, whilst the ruling limited a, limited a so-called security provision in favor of the rights of Palestinian drivers, the road was very rarely open for Palestinian traffic and essentially continued to be segregated. But this didn't violate the court order because with the kind of legal wrangling, the, the ruling stated that the military commander doesn't have the authority to completely ban the road to Palestinian traffic. So the language meant that the court legalized the ability of the military commander to legitimately ban Palestinian traffic on all but rare occasions. So it's an example of um, rubber stamping a discriminatory, discriminatory practice. So the question for the human rights lawyers working on behalf of Palestinians is whether they should take these um, sorts of petitions to the courts, knowing that it could have the effect of rubber stamping um, a discriminatory practice and thus um, rubber stamping some state, state violence. So an extension of these uh, the problems associated with the, these examples reflects this critique of liberal legalism, that engaging with the law enforcement system, employing litigation tactics for short-term protection, not focusing on underlying structural conditions and working on the false assumption that human rights are depoliticized has the effect of normalizing the system of state violence. One of the human rights organizations wrote a report stating that appearances also help grant legitimacy, both in Israel and abroad, to the continuation of the occupation. It makes it easier to reject criticism about the injustices of the occupation, thanks to the military's outward pretense that even it considers some acts unacceptable and backs up this claim by saying that it's already investigating these actions and going through legal avenues. So by filing cases to the High Court of Justice, human rights organizations play a role in assisting the court system to retain its legitimacy. It anesthetizes the liberal public to believe that the court system, the Israeli authorities are following a standard of law. So taking legal action can empower the regime and contribute to its sustainability. And the consequence is these underpinning structural problems are not addressed and therefore any immediacy or necessity in ending the occupation um, or liberating the Palestinians is obscured.
So going through um, these avenues, as um, human rights scholar David Kennedy says, um, by treating the symptoms alone will allow the disease not only to fester, but to seem like health itself. So the argument therefore is that if you work through institutions that perpetuate state violence, these organizations are actually playing a part in legitimizing that violence. Now, some of the human rights and um, organizations in Israel and Palestine have recognized this problem and they grappled with the question of whether you go for the short-term, potential short-term gains for individual Palestinians and individual issues, um, which would have the unintended effect of legitimizing the system. And what we've actually seen is their response is to reframe the, the situation. So firstly, they moved to a, uh, they had a paradigm shift from calling out an end to the human rights abuses under occupation to calling for an end to the occupation. So rather than focusing on, focusing on these, um, the tip of the iceberg symptoms, they look to um, address the underlying structures. Now, the issue is that those laws of occupation still apply if you're defining it as occupation so that hitting that balancing against security and human rights is still an issue. So the shift then has been a shift to defining the situation um, as one of apartheid. And once you define it as apartheid, the Israeli courts are understood as part of that apartheid regime. Um, and so it's about dismantling the regime as a whole, not by working within it. So essentially what I'm trying to argue is that inherent to the legal regime of human rights is this potential to uphold underlying structures that enable or cause human rights violations. So legitimizing and perpetuating um, state violence. And I think what this case study does is tell us a few things. And particularly when we um, look at it through these different framing of what the realities are. So one, it can tell us that international law in some cases can serve to protect the power of the state. Um, legal definitions are significant and can serve to normalize violation. So as I said, if you switch to defining it as a situation of occupation to one of apartheid, then the role of those human rights activisms and the avenues they have to create change shift. And they no longer need to work through the system, but it's about dismantling the system. And so what that extends to is an argument that we cannot expect to combat state violence through existing institutions, including international legal institutions, which we can argue ultimately serve the power of the state in the liberal international order. So if we want human rights claims to be effective, then according to um, scholars Brown and Halley, they must be rescued from the grip of legalism to uncover the fundamental political conditions creating injustice. So their role must be to about reorganizing power, reorganizing power asymmetry, um, rather than working within those. And we know from the history of the human rights movement that it's been um, one of revolutionary train change. So if human rights activism is gonna be successful, it um, needs to go through revolution rather than reform. So I think that I will leave it there for now. Thank you so much, Leonie. Um, and so next we will move to Ty. Um, I think you're going to share your screen, Ty, right? Yep, I'll do that right now. Brilliant. Can anyone give me a thumbs up if they can see that? Is that good? Okay, yeah, thank you. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, well, thank you so much to Andre for the invitation uh, to participate here today. It's a real pleasure to be here, and thanks to everyone for coming. Um, and hopefully what I have to say, I, I think will complement in some ways what uh, my other family, fellow panelists are saying. So uh, what I'd like to talk about today is to talk about violence from um, an emotions perspective. And so I've titled my talk, Affective Atmospheres of Violence. And what I would like to do, um, sorry, give me two seconds. I want to switch to presenter view. Oh. Great. So, and so what I want to do is talk about um, the prompt for the panel and, and from an emotions perspective. So the prompt that we were given was um, what might be gained by examining state violence, not just in global systems and structures, sort of the broad macro terms in which IR usually looks at violence, 
um, but also in terms of lived experiences and everyday realities. So I want to take an emotions perspective here, and I, I want to approach this from the perspective not necessarily of how individuals' emotions may or may not be affected by violence or propensity for violence, but rather from a relational shared collective emotions perspective. Right? And so specifically, I want to consider the question of emotions and violence through the concept of affective atmospheres, to think about the relationship between diffuse collective affects and what they do in sites and contexts where violence occurs. Right? And so my questions about atmospheres of violence come from an interest in how shared and intersubjective emotions shape the emotional milieu of a situation and how that situation becomes charged in a manner that brings violence from a state of potentiality to a state of actuality. Right? I'll just give you a, an example of, of the kind of empirical cases that got me interested in this. Right, So this there, here, here's a couple of quotes from a news reporting on uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine from last year, um, which sort of illustrate this phenomena at work out there in the world, or at least how it gets, gets reported. So some media reporting uh, toward the beginning of the war last year um, reported on what local conditions were like um, living in the war zone in, in Ukraine. So, for example, one UK correspondent for Sky News reported in June that it feels like there's been a change of atmosphere here in the Donbass, a sense of urgency, a sense that the Russians have momentum. Um, another outlet reported that uh, the war had fueled a protest mood in Russia. Um, elsewhere, it was reported that Ukrainian President Zelensky was seen to be playing to a change of mood around the war in his conversations with world leaders. Right? So, so phenomena such as collective atmospheres are often reported in journalistic accounts of war and violence and are also widely seen as popular explanations for outbreaks of violence. Right? Um, even more broadly, collective atmospheres and moods are often deployed as popular explanations for mass politics. So for example, recall how the rise of Trump in the US and the Brexit referendum in the UK were said to be decisively shaped by national atmospheres and populist national moods at the time. Right? Um, and of course, national moods uh, prior to elections, for example, are obsessively measured by pollsters to try to gauge how a population feels about the dominant issues of the day and the dominant candidates of the day, right? Yet, we tend not to use phenomena like moods and atmospheres as explanations in IR, and we tend not to use them as, as analytical concepts, right? So I, I'll mention two, two worthwhile exceptions here, which is um, Eric Ringmar has published some really interesting, a couple of really interesting articles on moods, and um, Bahar Romaleli has published recently a piece in Journal of International Relations and Development on ontological security and moods. But other than that, IR generally doesn't look at emotions from this perspective, right? And so, I mean, looking at news stories like this has got me interested to see if there is um, potential for developing atmospheres and moods as, as analytical concepts. So there's a couple questions that I want to kind of make gestures towards here today, if not answer um, definitively. So I'm interested in trying to develop the notion of atmosphere to focus on the spatial and affective conditions or dimensions of violence. And in so doing, I'm interested in these two questions, right? So number one, what do atmospheres of violence make possible, i.e. what do they do? And that'll become clear hopefully in a minute. Um, and two, how do broad structural conditions and causes, um, which are usually the focus of IR research, how do these manifest in micro-political spaces of violence, right? So how does the macro manifest in micro-political spaces? Right? And I want to suggest that attention to the affective and spatial dimensions of violence spotlights forces that are too often neglected in, in IR accounts of violence, right? So, um, so first, let's just give a really brief, really fairly broad brush take on how IR looks at violence. So IR, of course, was a field ostensibly founded on the, the study of um, study of war, right? But it's, it's only recently, fairly recently, that IR has turned attention towards um, questions of violence, right? And so war, in this sense, is not um, coterminous with violence, but of course, there's violence outside of 
established terms and conditions of war, right? So it, and it's really interesting that IR has only recently, with this panel and, and some other places, only fairly recently, you know, come to um, turn its attention towards violence um, in addition to war, right? So, um, so really broadly, there's there are at least two broad ways that IR looks at violence. Um, one is direct violence, direct physical violence, but also indirect or what we sometimes call structural or, or slow violence, right? So, um, so I'd like to position, or I think talking about atmospheres of violence, I want to position it sort of in between direct and indirect violence. Because I think that the atmospheres or, or moods have qualities of both without being reducible to, to either, right? And so I want to suggest that atmospheres of violence are mediating formations, um, closely related to, but conceptually and empirically distinct from both the direct forms of violence and structural or slow forms of violence, right? So they have qualities, atmospheres have qualities of direct violence. Um, insofar as atmospheres often affectively intensify spaces and increase the potential that direct violence might occur or might erupt. Um, yeah, atmospheres don't qualify as direct violence themselves as they cannot be said to manifest direct linear causation. So in other words, it's, it's hard to say that uh, something as diffuse or ephemeral as a mood or an atmosphere directly caused someone or a group of people to do something. I think that would be a tough case to make. Um, on the other hand, atmospheric violence has qualities of, of structural violence or slow violence as well, insofar as it, it, is, it is not direct violence, yet it's not really slow or indirect in the manner in which we usually think about structural violence. Right? And so I'm going to give a couple of empirical examples in a few minutes where hopefully this, this uh, uh, is, is clarified a bit, but I think thinking in terms of you know how atmospheres fit into how IR usually thinks about violence, I think it is sort of a mediating form of violence in between these two dominant forms that we don't often talk about. And so atmospheres um, bear some conceptual family resemblance between these two and overlaps with both direct and indirect violence, um, yet are coextensive with neither. And thus, I think it, it, we can make a case that it's, it's a distinct category of violence. Right? Um, and so for me, or how I like to think about it here, is that the concept of atmospheres uh, focuses attention on the emergent or on em emergent constellations of affects, relationalities of subjectivities, in a way that brings structural and situational forces together to analyze how outbreaks of violence happen in particular sites and spaces. And so with that view of how IR usually looks at violence in mind, what I think we need then is an alternative framework that accounts for how structural conditions sometimes become intensified and bring into play what may be less salient structural conditions to the forefront of people's affective and spatial experiences. And so atmospheres are one way of understanding these moments and spaces of int intensification. So it's it's it's... It's trying to think about how structural conditions don't, just don't work on structural levels, but they have um, they they filter down have a, have effects in micro political spaces. I'm trying to think of atmospheres as a lens through how those processes might work, right? And so while violence is almost always caused and influenced by multiple factors, atmospheres might be seen here as facilitating and amplifying conditions that spatially and affectively envelop subjects and shift senses of agency in ways that bring violent potential into actualized harm, right? So atmospheres can be um, situational, they can be collective, they can even be transnational sometimes. Um, they often, almost always, intensify contexts of violence um, or contexts of violent potential in ways that dramatically we might say raise or increase the likelihood of actual outbreaks of violence. And so this approach to violence, an atmospheric approach to violence, um, is a more situated and, situated and spatially concentrated one in contrast to IR's mostly macro-focused um, um, ways of thinking about violence. Right, so, so what are affective atmospheres? Right, so here I'm going to draw from a, a varied literature across um, across IR, but mostly across fields such as human geography and cultural studies to try to distill down how we might think about 
what affective atmospheres are, right? So what do I mean by affective atmospheres? Uh, well, in, in one sense, we all know what they are because we can feel them, right? So it's this the idea of feeling the atmosphere of a room and scaling that that phenomena up to up to collective levels, right? So everyone knows the experience of walking to a room or a classroom or a theater or a sports event or a hospital or a church, and you automatically know what it feels like. And through that feeling, you know what is a, is called for in terms of your embodied performance and behavior in that space. Right? So the concept tries to capture the more ambient, fuzzy, or even tonal aspects of emotions, while at the same time viewing these as viewing these characteristics as intrinsic features of both individual and collective affective experience. Um, and here I followed uh, human geographer Ben Anderson's description of atmospheres, um, uh, where he develops it as a novel account to think about the tensions evolved in collective affects. Right, and he has a really a um, couple of really nice quotes where he kind of says that atmospheres are impersonal in the sense that they belong to collective situations, yet they can obviously be felt as intensely personal, right? So one can sense the atmosphere of an event, um, yet it is often inexpressible even to those who feel that they are enveloped by it. So you can feel the, the mood of a protest, for example, without really quite being able to put precisely uh, your finger on what it is that you're that you're experiencing. Words can't quite capture um, the experience itself, yet it still affects you, right? Um, so moods are are difficult to discursively express, but they're clearly viscerally sensed. Um, atmospheres also affect behavior in very practical and lived ways, right? So cultural theorist Raymond Williams, um, who fo folks might be familiar with, um, he studied. Um, basically this notion, but he called them structures of feeling. And he was looking at kind of culture-wide um, moods and literature and culture. Um, but he, he noted that um, structures of feeling exert palpable pressures and set effective limits on experience and action. So when you walk into that room, when you walk into that classroom or religious space, um, they exert palpable pressures on how we think we should behave in that space or what we can say and what we can't say and what's appropriate and what's not appropriate, right? So atmospheres often do this by setting, we might call these sorts of affective expectations for behavior in what the situation seems to call for, right? Um, and they do this regulative work by opening up and also closing down possibilities for emotional experience um, and also behavior and social connections, right? So certain types of experiences you'll have in a, in a religious space that you won't have in a classroom or in a domestic setting or whatnot. So, so atmospheres um, do regulative work in a sense of setting expectations. And we just sort of, sort of subconsciously or non-consciously adjust to these situations when we find ourselves enveloped by them, right? So, so I want to take this idea and try to extend it to political spaces. So for example, um, an anxious or an angry national atmosphere, if we can talk of such a thing, opens up possibilities for strident political discourse and even political violence. Right? So I think we've seen more of this in recent years in places, um, just think of my own country, the U.S., we've definitely seen something like this happening in the past few years in the U.S., especially since um, January 6th, which I'll mention in a minute. Um, and so in this sense, atmospheres and moods can significantly influence subjects', subjects senses of agency, right? So by regulating the affective experiences of those who are enveloped by them, atmospheres shape how bodies make their way into a space and how they negotiate being present in that space, right? And as such, atmospheres modulate our agency. They shape how we feel and find our way, including how we find our way alongside others. So put very simply, um, if I'm in a bad mood, uh, my sense of agency or my, my, my energy levels feel quite decreased or quite depressed. Uh, whereas if I'm in a good mood, um, I feel more energized and, and mobilized. And, and, and to some degree that works as well on a collective level, right? So even think about your classroom experience, you walk into a class one day, and the energy level might be quite low amongst students. Um, the next day it might be quite high. And those different um, kind of classroom moods open up different options for you about how you handle that as a lecturer or a teacher and vice versa. So, so those different energy levels quite distinctly affect um, how we make our way uh, through that space. Yeah.
So just a couple of examples of how I've been trying to think about this recently in terms of um, political violence. So, and this is, I should say this all quite speculative. I've been I'm kind of working on paper along these lines. Um, that I'm not finished yet, so I'm still working through <laughs> how all this works. But when, when I've looked at cases like the My Lai Massacre and the, the Vietnam War in 1968, or even something much more recent, the January 6th um, insurrection attempt at the U.S. Capitol in 2021. I think there's something like atmospheres distinctly at work in these sites. So if you read, read accounts of the My Lai Massacre, um, I won't go through the whole history of the massacre, but there was when, you know, you know Congress is taking testimony on, on this afterwards, there were accounts of... Um, soldiers speaking to the mood within the platoon about how you know killing the killing of women and children and the the destruction of this village um happened and to some extent it was planned but another extent once soldiers got going gunning down civilians the the thing took on a life of its own so to speak so there's something distinctly affective and collective and relational about how the shared affects of the, um, amongst the soldiers um, amplified and intensified the situation in a way that wasn't planned, right? And I think something similar was at work on January 6th, and we, even though we now know that this was to some extent, to significant extent, planned, there were there was a degree over the course of that day or that afternoon where something like an atmosphere was built up and took hold that, that kind of charged up the crowd to, to, to a degree that they broke into windows in the Capitol, right? So um, so I think we can look at ca cases like war atrocities or cases like um, protests that turn into you know, violent riots. That there is something at work here in terms of atmospheric intensities that tell us something interesting about how not only violence breaks out, but how it's maybe sustained over a, a certain period of time, right? So um, and I, don't, I don't think the... The ways we normally talk about violence in IR in the kind of traditional macro senses or in the direct or indirect senses quite captures what these kind of cases illustrate. Um, and so that's why I think um, atmospheres are quite an interesting perspective, hopefully a novel perspective to help make sense of um, these sorts of cases without making claims that, you know, I'm certainly not making claims that we should disregard macro counts of violence, but I think this, what I'm trying to get at here is to position atmospheric accounts sort of, again, in between kind of direct and indirect accounts that we that we normally talk about. So I'll I have no idea how much time I have left, but I'll go ahead and conclude anyway. Um, I just want to conclude by flagging up um, some further inspiration I've I've found that, that got me interested in this topic. And this is the first chapter of Fanon's Wretched of the Earth, where he talks about atmospheres of violence in the colony, right? And he has a really harrowing, fascinated account of what it's like to live in the colony under, under violent occupation and what happens when the colonized start to become, start to politically organize, basically. And so I just want to spotlight Fanon's account in closing, right? So Fanon describes in detail the role of what he calls atmospheric violence between the colonizer and the colonized, um, and his description of the every, everyday fear, tension, pressure, and anxiety under foreign occupation remains uh, remains a, a unique account of violence, I think. And so he talks about, quote, the atmosphere of violence is just under the skin, he says, of, of the colonized. Um, it is deeply embodied, deeply relational, and a collectively shared, and is collectively shared and experienced by the colonized. And so he has this count of, of, of when a local leader amongst the colonized um, calls a meeting, he says there's, you people can feel there's there's blood in the air, he says. And the ensuing flurry of activities, he, he, he goes on to describe uh, the coming and going, the listening of speeches, um, seeing people assembled together in one place, the military demonstrations, the ensuing arrests, all of this hubbub, he says, makes the people think that the moment has come for them to take action, right? So there's a very atmospheric account talking about not just how these collective affects sort of gather under the skin, as he says, but sort of shapes people's senses of agency that 
that that he says now is the time to act there there comes to be a feeling that's now is the moment that that presents a political opportunity for 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 action right so um so this has been kind of a, a kind of a amalgamation of different kinds of ideas i'm still working through but um, i'll go ahead and end it there and thanks all for listening Thank you so much, Ty. Sorry, it's so much harder to keep time on a Zoom. <laughs> um, but you did a great job at, at, on the 15 minutes. So thank you very much. And just a reminder to um, to audience members, if you want to put questions into the Q&A or in the, or in the chat, um, the Q&A is probably the easiest way to do it. As we go, please do continue to add your questions. And now we'll move to Sashi Sundaram. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Andri. And uh, it's such a pleasure to be here. And and thank you for the previous presenters as well. Um, some of uh, the ideas that I am going to articulate here follows from what Leonie said, what Ty said as well, um, but in a different trajectory, because I liked the conclusion what uh, Ty was offering in terms of the difference between the colonized and the colonizer. So I want to address this uh, topic of state violence um, that we all know is sort of deeply challenging and profoundly important in the light of uh, the hypocrisies of the rules-based international order. So I want to do this by taking two steps. First, I want to unpack the very nature or the changing nature of the state in the global South um, as a consequence of the uh, histories of Western empire and imperialism. Second, I want to examine the consequences of the changing nature of the state on the changing nature of violence in its epistemic and physical forms. Of course, there are many different forms of violence, but I'm analytically focusing only on these two, that cuts across the division between the global North and South. In other words, my argument, um, it's a broader argument, not very uh, case specific as the previous two presentation is, uh, but I think the broader argument is um, there is a profound similarity in how monopoly on the use of violence became the most important legitimizing factor to establish the transcendental validity of the states that connects both global North and South. But by focusing on the different types of violence, it also shows a variation in how elites um, and minorities experience different forms of violence, and it has implications on how we think about order and disorder. So in the next 10 minutes, I want to sort of unpack this, uh, what I see as a connection between state transformation and the transformation of violence, um, and to begin a conversation on why the chickens are coming home to roost, both in the West and in the global South states, because and not despite the hypocrisies of our world. So to begin with, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the state transformation, at least the idea of what is the broader notion of the state and how should we really be thinking about what is going on right now. And state violence is very much core to the understanding of the state, be it police brutality, military oppression, governmental surveillance and suppression of free speech. I think most of us would broadly agree that belongs to the idea of state violence, which is very different from interpersonal violence, for example. Um, so state violence belongs to this realm of collective violence. But I want to take a step back here because we must not equate the state with the government or regimes, which is often the case in international relations and comparative politics literature. Governments uh, come and go. If you believe that uh, sovereignty rests with the people, governments are only authorized representatives of the state, of, of the people, sorry. But governments can also be authorized representatives of the state itself to work for the common good. This was the idea of uh, Quentin Skinner's famous view of the fictional view of the state uh, propounded by Thomas Hobbes. But no matter which position you come from, the predominant sort of Western view of the state is that the state is a transcendental entity. It is, it is very different from the government, um, but it has an eternity of life. But something really shifted in the early uh, 17th, 18th, and very importantly in the 19th century. With the impact of Western empire and imperialism, this view of the state spread across the world, uh, backed up by um, Western economic and military power. This spread of this transcendental view of the state to the non-European world, I think, also went along with an operational understanding of the state based on a Weberian view that only the state has the monopoly on the use of force, along with notions of the territory, bureaucratic force, and so on. 
what it did, I think, is um, it slowly eradicated the pre-existing views of the state in the non-Western world. I'm not talking just the views about the government, the kings, the monarchs, and so on, um, or dynasties, but there was also pre-existing views of the state in the transcendental understanding of what is the state, what is the common good. Um, and um, historians, and particularly intellectual historians, are um, showing to us that the idea of being Republican or anti-corruption um, or several other important ideas that are transcendentally valid to the notion of the state was persistent despite changes in dynasties. So, for example, in India, China, Persia, parts of Africa, they did not envisage, at least the elites who were thinking about the transcendental role of the state, most of them were philosophers, um, monks, um, as well as important religious figures who did not think about the state as um, in its primary role as monopolizing violence. Right. Um, Ibn Khaldun, already in 1377 uh, in Mukaddisma, says there is a general idea of the state that is beyond the idiosyncrasies of dynasties. But even in the 19th century, um, when the march of the Western state becomes stronger and harder, backed up by military and economic power, Christopher Bailey shows um, that there was a, sort of an alternative ideas of the Akhlaq tradition, for example, that envisaged a different view of the state in articulating justice. And in some other parts of the non-European world, the idea of the state was that of a supervisor, which also constrained um, what it could do through consultations, for example, but at the same time also getting ideas based on what is uh, what the religious supervisors are saying, what other segments of population are saying in terms of tax revenues, what is going on in the bazaars, for example, in terms of increasing revenue and profit. So um, another example here, which I also want to bring is um, the difference even within those sort of non-Western world. In the north of India, for example, India's um, Ra Raja Ram Mohan Rai, who is considered the father of modern India, had a transcendental view of the state, not just about the government and this government or this actor and that actor, a transcendental view of the state where ethics and duties took a center stage. In the south of India, with a particular idea of statecraft that comes with literature such as Tirukural, the idea of the state also was embedded with the notion of being responsible in terms of poverty, when there's a poverty, when there is problems of uh, despair, the state has to play an important cooperative role. So the idea of the state there envisaged was not necessarily confined to violence, even if violence was one part of articulating um, the role of the state. Uh, danda, for example, or punishment was pretty much part of uh, the conception of the state, but not predominantly uh, the central aspect of uh, the idea of the state. What I want to point out is that at least uh, this is fairly evident in recent years that with the march of Western empire and imperialism, these sort of alternative ideas were slowly eradicated. No, not immediately, but slowly eradicated. And uh, both uh, the Hegelian views of the state, communism, fascism, liberalism, were all equally complicit in sort of eradicating these alternative views of the state, both in the West, as well as in the non-Western world. And here is the curious twist of turn, which is both the non-European nationalists, as well as sort of anti-colonial um, actors within the European non-European setting, sort of bought into this idea. They understood um, from Asia, Africa, and Latin America that, well, yes, maybe we have to have a proper view of the state, which is on the monopolization of violence. And uh, they followed, some followed the liberal traditional view, at least uh, if you think about India or some of the early liberals in the, uh, in the Republic in China, for example, that there is no difference uh, from the semantic word of the state and the government. And some others actually um, helped consolidate this transcendental view of the state, um, which is coming from the West anyway. And that is why we, when we see the global South, we see a more regal kingly presence when prime ministers walk around. And um, when ministers walk around, they, they believe that they are coming with a particular view of uh, their state, which is a transcendental view, but state being equated with the government. But others explicitly rejected, uh, other non-Europeans here, explicitly rejected the, the philosophical, cosmological, religious uh, views of the state that is coming from the non-Western world, as well as from the Western world. They believe that there's one single trajectory and the trajectory is uh, state being the sort of performer of violence. But something 
also happened at the same time because the Western view of the state also simultaneously saw a big transformation. It became more powerful because of its mil military and economic power, but it also became imbricated quite strongly with status, la stato, and recognition, along with complex legal debates on what is sovereignty. Such a view consolidated immediately after the end of the Second World War that looked back to geopolitics, particularly the period of uh, new imperialism or social Darwinism, to talk about how the state will be playing an important role in establishing order and establishing sort of the presence of who is right and who is wrong, what is good and what is bad. But to the end of the Cold War, there was also an important transformation of the state in the West, where all these things were treated as something was as, as, as a mistake. Uh, the West now emphasized uh, markets, corporations. The focus was on the decentralized idea of who is an individual and human rights, as Leonie talked about before, um, came about as an important um, focus for thinking about what is the future of the international system. But herein lies the rub. This was particularly problematic for global South states that were now slowly consolidating a view of the state, which is about the monopoly on the use of force. It led to ontological insecurity, but also a series of existential anxiety, because by the time they were figuring out that this is our view of the state, and this is the sort of notion that our state will be the monopolizer on the use of force, the West repudiated that idea to some extent. And this repudiation came along with the notion that uh, previously those views that were dear to the non-West were somehow revived and breathed, they breathed new air into it. So attempting to religious diversity or being hopeful about mobility in the during the Cold War or early, um, at least after the 9-11, the idea was that um, mobility is bad. You can't let uh, people just move across borders. Mm, it is just not good. We have to have a proper territorially defined borders. And most sort of global South states acknowledge those sort of ideas, um, even at the cost of some mobile populations, including nomadic populations um, who were interested in mobility and who were making a living out of mobility. But then comes the very idea of Schengen, which focuses on European mobility as European Union, bringing back intra-European mobility as this noble idea of normative power Europe. But this was very much part of the notion of the state in the non-Western world, which was first repudiated, then taken over, and then asked to be sort of taken as the gold standards of how security communities exist without borders and how we are peaceful. And those barbarians on the other side are just not peaceful or... And this, this put many global South states in a state of consistent sort of existential anxiety about what is the most expected ways of organizing the state. And this existential anxiety manifested in the, in the form of violence, quite frequently in the form of articulating violence in a performative way in order to establish the, the focus that we are a state and we are here to stay. The problem is the Western state was not a model, but an instance of a historical experience. How this instance of a historical experience became a model is an, is an issue of power, power of uh, European military and economic dominance or the American military and economic dominance and so on. But non-Western states now had to emulate the historical experience to get the right model. In other words, they want to emulate the conditions under which Western states became focused on violence in the first place. And thus we see a continuous nature of violence. This I think is the first part of my argument which showed this macro dimension on how continuous transformation of what a state is and what is a state is very much impregnated in the big dividing line between what the global North thinks the state is and what the global South thinks as or performs as what the state should be doing. And these constant sort of hypocrisies that goes on in the West, which is manifested as the state not doing its duties or responsibilities comes across as not allowing the global South to consolidate its own position as a viable player. The second part of the argument is um, violence. I'll, want, I'll now want to focus not on the transformation of the state, but how the transformation of the state is also changing the nature of violence particularly in its epistemic and physical form that cuts across this division between global North and South. If um, I can elaborate this a little bit, it is not that in the first instance, what we saw is this, is this huge division between the global North and South in terms of state transformation. 
But if we take the different variations of violence seriously, these sort of violence has cut across this global North and South division. And one of the important manifestation of that is, or at least what I want to focus on here is physical and epistemic violence. With the circulation of transnational elites, um, along with the transformation of the state, what happened is that global South elites to a large extent believed that, well, we allow us the ability to exercise monopoly on the use of force, monopoly on violence, and we will resolve our problems. But the real fundamental problems that these elites faced was an epistemic violence, not being heard. Thus, they organized the non-aligned movement or the Bang Dong conference or um, G77 and all sorts of important interventions into being heard. And thus, more the sort of like an oppression of uh, not allowing to think allowed these non-Western um, and global South actors to articulate the injustices of epistemic violence in order to formulate new global spaces for conversation. But there was also other transnational but not elites, but non-elites who were engaged in transnational mobility. These were the workforce, the coolies, laskers, plantation workers, and some street protesters, including anarchists, um, who were very much in the front line of physical and immediate violence. For these, for the elites, what really mattered was being heard so that we will resolve the problems of physical violence in our state um, by the way which we think fit, which is the model that was offered in the West anyway on consolidating police power and military power. But for those others, um, elites who are non-elites, sorry, who are circulating in this transnational sphere, when physical violence was direct and oppressive, they did not have access to talk about epistemic violence, they want to somehow stop this physical violence where the state was just unable to help or unable to inform these sort of debates. There is also an immediate shift that happens where global elites in the North and global elites in the South co-opted each other's ideas in many ways. And these, these ideas led to the notion that we can jointly think about running or understanding the management of international order. And thus this co-optation worked with thinking about international order where nation was considered as equal to the state and the state as equal to the government, which led to many important global South actors appropriating and to some extent endorsing these views. I really respect many Global South actors as well, but Nehru, Nikruma, or Sukarno, or many other important actors were also to some extent important global transnational elites who were co-opted with the system to think that this is the one better way to think about the world. This is precisely because alternative ways of thinking about the state were eradicated in their own states, particularly coming from, let's say, Mahatma Gandhi in India, or important ideas that were coming from indigenous movements in Latin America, or cosmological ideas that were coming from the Incas. These were all eliminated slowly by their own elites in, in consonance and somehow in response to the global march of the transcendental idea of the state. But this cooptation did not quite work in the way that the global South actors wanted to work. They believed that such cooptation will allow sort of the ability to voice the abuse because of epistemic in violence and bring about more development and cooperation. But what we saw is that an important state transformation also happens in the West, where now everything was now repudiated um, in terms of the state and the focus became on the individual dignity. The focus became on human rights. The focus became on protecting gender identities and so on. But with an epistemic violence under, on, but working under the epistemic violence, but folk facing a huge transformation on the idea of who is an individual in the West led to really serious problems and paradoxes that manifested in the form of violence, particularly in the global South. And this sort of manifestation of violence led is, I don't want to call it as a causal effect of the hypocrisy of the West, but to a large extent, it is constituted in the hypocrisy of the West, particularly if we see this connection between state transformation on one hand and how epistemic and physical violence manifest in protecting the idea of the state in the global south, but using the co-optation methods in order to articulate new ideas of the world, but something that is just not working, we see that when the West pushes for the notion that Russia is the most or is the colonial power here and we have to talk about the agency of the rest, which is Ukraine, and quite not following those ideas in systematic ways when they're talking about Israel and Palestine and without 
settling on the ideas of who is the colonizer and who is actually being oppressed, it demonstrates at least to the Global South actors the hypocritical nature of the international system for which the performative role of the state is extremely important in order to articulate their voice. That is the paradox of our times. And if that is the paradox of our times, what we see is this appropriation in rhetoric, particularly notions of the state being extremely performative in the global south on who they are and why they've come to be. They have come to be precisely because their time has come in order to have far reaching consequences in the lives of their own people. But at the same time, their time has come to show that we have perfected a model of the state which can now play an important role in international order. But the West believes, to some extent, this notion of the international order is now being moved into world order, where the focus is pretty much on the individuals. And that sort of tensions leads to more a climate of fear and mis mistrust. And, and if uh, I want to buy the previous uh, sessions, that previous arguments by Leonie and Tai, that all sorts of legal regime does not carry the trust it does among people in the global south or among elites in the global south because of the hypocrisies within which it was dealt with in the West in the first place. And um, I want to conclude the conversation here by saying that if we look at this con continuous ongoing state transformation on the one hand and the various formations or various varieties of state violence in its physical and epistemic form, we see more a reassertion of state power where performance of violence become more important rather than actually resolving problems in the society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sashi. And then finally, we'll move to last but of course not least, uh, Jasmine Kani from University of St. Andrews. Great. Thank you so much, Andre, and to everyone else who presented. Fantastic presentations. Actually, I think um, yeah, if my presentation hopefully follows on quite well from those and it touches on some of the themes that they raise. I'm just going to put my timer on. Um, I'll try and finish sooner, actually. So um, my presentation is coming from a post-colonial perspective. And so I begin with the definition of the state. Um, a lot of um, my fellow panelists have already talked about how do we define it? And that obviously has huge implications of how we then understand state violence. And to really simply put it, um, I would read the state as um, a product of uh, colonial processes. Um, it's a product of modernity, which from a decolonial perspective is has coloniality baked into it. And therefore, state violence is also therefore reflective of global processes that historically have race, nationalism, and militarism as core components of the modern nation state. So I would argue um, that state violence is enabled by and is also reflective of what I've called racial militarism. So this builds on a paper that I've already published, but it's an ongoing project in which I'm expanding it to think about the nature of, of the colonial nation state. And so in these, I'll just summarize some of the key arguments. And there's three sections um, or three core arguments that I make. I think I'll focus more on two of them, one of them just briefly. And this is the idea that racial militarism as this enabling ideology, enabling ideology for state violence, is actually built on a historical relationality by the colonial states, primarily Europe, colonial relationality, historical relationality with in its foundation initially with the Muslim Orient due to proximity and warfare, but then, then extends to, to other regions. And that this contributes to a civilizational anxiety, which then constitutes this racial militarism. But I also want to make clear, and I, I will do so in the last part of my presentation, that this is not just about the colonial state, but also affects the colonized, right? So it affects the other side of the colonial encounter. So the post-colony may also reflect um, examples of racial militarism may be constituted by these processes, demonstrates an internalization of those European anxieties and uh, stigmas in an attempt to demonstrate civilizational superiority because of those, um, both against enemies at home and abroad. So I argue that racial militarism, which allows state violence to occur, is reflective of three things. 
The first is this ties in very much with, um, with the previous presentation that it's reflective of a performance, a performance of racial chauvinism to mitigate civilizational anxiety. Secondly, it acts at home, especially as a means of exclusion of creating insider outsider boundaries. And finally, it acts as a tool of delegitimation and a racialization of dissent even if it's not against those who might can be racialized as others, a racialization, a racialization of dissent precisely in order to carry out violence. So how do I arrive at these positions? So to start with, even if we look at very basic definitions of racism on one hand and militarism on the other hand, both of them are actually primarily about domination and supremacy. So the moment we're talking about domination and supremacy, we're actually talking about hierarchies. So that being my starting point, I actually turned to Fanon. And so Tai, um, your conclusion was, was really apt and relevant here. Um, and Fanon explored, of course, the construction of racial and civilizational anxieties at depth in his work. So most scholars um, rightly focus on um, the more famous Wretched of the Earth and it has a more of an international element. But for my arguments, I actually draw from Fanon's psychoanalytic work in Black Skins, White Masks, where he explores the psychological processes behind the construction of these racial hierarchies and why they even get reproduced, even amongst the colonized. And he states, I quote, the feeling of infer inferiority of the colonized is cor correlative to the Europeans' feeling of superiority, right? So there is that relationality that I talked about. So the notion of European superiority is according to Fanon, according is, is a psychological need to feel dominant, the need to impose that superiority complex on those that they subjugate. Now, this is not just speculation on the part of Fanon, um, but in fact describes the active intellectual efforts by Europeans in the 17th century to construct a hierarchical civilizational schema. So these hierarchies constituted civilized at the top, barbarians in the middle, and at the bottom savages, um, embedded by Enlightenment knowledge production, and often was used to, in fact, justify colonial expansion. And so these became um, indispensable guides during the 19th century, as we see that military expansion by European states. And so civil the civilizational schema became a naturalized part of even academic um, inquiry in politics, in discourse. And what's really interesting, and I think uh, while I don't talk about it in my presentation, but I think it has implications for the events, really devastating events we've been seeing in the past um, couple of weeks, is that there are two features identified um, in the schema which reflect that ability to, um, to be civilized. The first is the ability to, to industrialize, and the second is the capacity for more sophisticated and destructive warfare. That actually is reflective in a lot of this knowledge that's produced in the 18th and the 19th century of greater civilizational traits. So in according to one leading anthropologist in this period, he actually argues that um, colonization, in fact, for the European states allows for this proximity between the lower races and the higher races, and therefore, in fact, allows the lower races to learn civilizational traits, right, through that association and allows them to abandon their backward cultures. Now, for Fanon, of course, this transition is not seen as development, but is a sign that colonization has extended from the physical to mental oppression. And he, in fact, reserved his most searing criticism in black skin, white masks, not for the colonizers, but for the natives who internalized that imperialist ideology, right, because of an inferiority complex. So I call this proximity, this forced proximity through colonization, um, a colonial relationality. And Fanon himself, why he doesn't he doesn't separate these particular categories, you can read into them through his descriptions. And so I identify three types of internalization. And the first is the colonized person whose internalization is expressed by accepting the colonizer's hierarchy as a natural order of humanity. They therefore become dependent on the colonizer. They pose no threat to their superiority. The second, which is a really interesting category, is the colonized who internalizes colonial stigmas, but seeks to resist them. And the third and the final category is the colonized who emancipates themselves complete, through complete indifference of how they're perceived by the colonizer. And that's seen as true emancipation through mental detachment. Now, I'm very briefly going to, I'm not going to go into detail, but how I split that middle category. So the one who is actually um, colonized internalizes those um, 
colonial stigmas, but seeks to resist them. So the two ways in which this resistance may happen, I argue, is through a fleeing and attempting to flee by demonstrating or reperforming those um, indicators of racial chauvinism that are similar, mimicking the European colonizers, but also through transferal, by trying to deposit some of those stigmas that may be placed on them onto a constructed internal other. So how can we reconnect this back to the militarism, which then enables a state violence? So that civilizational hierarchy I just outlined and the European need to position themselves at the top of it is expressed especially through military advancement and this capacity to destroy as a necessary part of that transition from one epoch of human development to the next. So we have plenty of examples from Enlightenment um, philosophers talking about martial valor as being far more important than economic prosperity to demonstrate the advancement of a nation. Friedrich Engels himself also talked about what type of development you need in the military and the type of destruction that is possible in order to graduate from one epoch to the next. Now, what's interesting about this timing is, that, as I mentioned, it's in relationality to initially an ascendant orient. And so we see that there's an insecurity and a civilizational anxiety that pushes this desire for, for militarism, right? So which constitutes this racial element. Now, I'm not going to focus on this aspect because that's more about the colonial context or the international context. And rather, I want to talk about um, two context, two um uh, means through which we see this racial militarism, um, which enables state violence. So the first is within the state, um, in the metropole or in the colony, um, which produces these inside outsider boundaries that I mentioned. So feminist scholarship, of course, has already expanded the way that we understand militarism as having a deeper socio-political function within the state beyond a basic military one. The fact that it plays a unifying role and strengthens the, strengthens the cohesion of an insider group. But as with any nationalist endeavor, this creation of a strong insider community requires a clear outsider category as well. And again, militarism plays a prominent role in this. So historically, masculinity combined with militarism defined who was a good nationalist, while the perceived lack of these traits became a source of shame and a delegitimation of one's nationalist credentials. Now, the key function is not only to confer an identity, but also to enact this exclusionary politics within the nation state. But it's not only the fact that you're feminized and stigmatized. I would argue also that this requires an ideal racial identity within the nation state or in the colony. And it produces this inverted type as well. So a person who can't participate in, doesn't support the nation's militarism is stripped not only of their masculinity, but also of their civilized identity. So the non-militarized person or the one that seems in, unable to perform the same level of destruction um, is then feminized is racialized, is deemed barbaric and expected to remove themselves from public life. I want to then finally talk about, um, so this is replicated in the colonies, but I now want to talk about what I mentioned was the internalization um, that occurs in the post-colony. So here I want to focus on the example of, of the Syrian regime and discuss how it has sought historically to escape those internalized stigmas, right? So bearing in mind that, of course, it shares a border with Israel, has historically been at war prior, prior to that, had been colonized by the French. And so militarism has been a core part of, of Syrian society, of Syrian politics. It's actually been a way in which they've reflected their anti-colonialism. But often what we overlook is that there may be a racial component to this as well. And without actual military triumphs against their colonial enemies, the regime still needed to find its own internal other over whom it could declare victory. So then who became that internal, that local other under Syria's militarism? So under Hafez al-Assad's authoritarianism, it is true that all political dissidents were othered, um, we can see that in the extremes of the regime's apparatus of power, the need to humiliate one's opponents at home actually signified this reproduction of a racial hierarchy as a way of transferring those stigmas. But again, I think here the role of the Islam um, can't be overlooked in this process or the Orientalism, right, in that early European relationality that has actually been transferred to the colony. 
So this othering of religion in the political sphere in Syria provided the regime with a racial justification for its violence against so-called Islamists. And that's not to say that A, there wasn't a threat from those Islamists, or B, that the state never co-opted Islam for the sake of legitimacy. But all of those versions are very acceptable quietist versions. In contrast, the Muslim Brotherhood in the Syrian state advocated for a public and a political role for Islam and positioned themselves as opponents to the Syrian state. So we then see, especially in this comes to a head in the 1980s, and we see this really um, an example in which those Orientalist stigmas are transferred by the Syrian regime onto this internal stigmatized other in order to prop up its civilizational valor. And the most disturbing example of this is the racialization of dissent found in the events of 1982, when there was an instigation of an uprising in the Syrian city of Hama, initially by the Muslim Brotherhood, but then involved wider members of the population. And the regime's crushing response was a show of militarist masculinity um, against the easy target of an already racialized, barbarized other. The ferocity is reflected um, by the fact that the entire city had been razed to the ground. We don't have direct reports of what happened because there was a media blackout. Anything between 5,000 sometimes have been reported, 20,000 people massacred. So I'm closing the presentation with the examples that we can find um, have been collated in Lisa Wadeen's recent book, looking at the regime's discourse against the Muslim Brotherhood in official newsletters between 1976 to 1982, um, where we can see deeply racialized and gendering framings, regular references to backwardness and corruption, applying a civilizational narrative, encoded references to the Muslim Brotherhood throughout the newspapers. There's regular disturbing usage of the word vermin, who are depicted, I quote, as contaminating the bod body politic. Lots of classic racist terminology that we've most notoriously saw deployed in Nazi Germany to dehumanize Jews, paving the way for genocide actually reflected in a lot of this discourse. And a lot of it also was exactly in the same sentences would then be contrasted with the Syrian army as reflecting this, I quote, revolutionary spirit emulating the morals of the Arab night. And what this demonstrates is that there's a discursive power of religion. So even where you have those who have nothing to do with religion, the minute that you use that label, what Rabia Khan talks about as having this racializing gendered component, um, it can actually classify all dissidents as being dispensable. And to close, even after the death of Hafiz al-Assad, we see these tropes and strategies revived during the civilian protest in 2011 and the subsequent conflict when all opposition groups, even secular liberals, were characterized as Al-Qaeda affiliates or Muslim Brotherhood affiliates. Very similar language used, coded references to the Middle Ages, words such as barbaric, backward, or savage to deploy the civilizational schema. And what was really interesting is that this narrative was often directed towards non-Arab audiences, especially in the West, with a very clear motive in wanting to delegitimize the uprisings by connecting them to the West's own racialized and stigmatized other. So for many Western observers and governments, whose own racial militarism was conceived in imperialism in proximity to the Orient, the Syrian regime's secular authoritarianism, as brutal as it was, was still deemed more tolerable, more civilized even than a constructed fanatical backward religious alternative. Um, so I think I'll end there when my time's running out. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Um, so some really thought provoking um, perspectives that, and I think all these um, talks went really well together and sort of um, it integrated kind of the, the in, sort of jumped off each other and integrated similarities and brought new perspectives as well. So this was really brilliant. Um, thank you so much. So what we'll do, we have a few minutes left for questions. Um, can I also just introduce quickly Terrilyn Huntington, who's joining us. She is the online events facilitator from the iEthics section. Um, and so it's gonna to help to facilitate the Q&A. We have a few questions that have gone into the Q&A section. Um, so I can summarize them briefly. And then if anybody um, in the audience, if you still have questions, please add them to the Q&A or to the chat and uh, I'll summarize questions briefly and then we'll return to the panelists to answer them. And if new questions come up that you also see and want to address, please do that as well. So um, 
go on to the questions in the Q&A. Also, thanks to Indigit, who I think had to leave, but has sort of become our de facto discussant. So very uh, generous of him in, in his uh, questions and responses. Um, so first is a question for Leone. Um, does the apartheid position also include support of mass resistance to that system? And otherwise, would its effects not be limited? Um, for Thai, uh, a question regarding an article by sociologist Herbert Bloomer, a 1958 article, Race Prejudice as a Sense of Group Position. Um, is this complementary to the approach that you're taking? Um, and then um, for Sashi, um, a question, uh, in the background of extension of citizenship by the current Indian government to minorities in South Asian countries other than Muslims, how can we, we relate this to the question of state violence with minorities in India? And also a question to Sashi, um, which I think you've answered in the chat too, um, but just to draw attention to that as well. Um, colonialism was built largely on state and other violence, or at least the violent defeat of their monarchical and other opponents. But there were in what became colonial territories, entities and states and regimes that were militarily defeated, states with either a monopoly or near monopoly of violence. Um, and I'm just going to add quickly before we go back to the panel and do keep input and questions as they come up. Um, this is sort of a broad question for all panelists as well. And thinking about kind of the the perspectives and the um, examples that you've brought up, I think as well, generally, when we're talking about how violence um, is discussed and studied in IR. I wonder if you've got any thoughts about the general kind of name and conventions. And I think this feeds into some of the discussion on legitimacy um, that's come up. But I think in IR in general, there's lots of euphemisms for violence that are used, like war, strategic action, collateral damage, casualties, targeted strikes. And then critical scholarship um, tends to do a better job at using the language of violence. And that tends to be the scholarship that, for want of a better way to phrase it, can be considered sort of victim centric and um, there's probably a much better way to say that but thinking about sort of feminism post-colonial approaches in particular and so I wonder if you've got any broad thoughts on kind of you know what that means for the discipline in general I guess um any thoughts about that and I'm just having a look I don't see any more questions popping up so let's return to the panelists and you can each respond and I, I hope you can see those questions because I know I just raced over them really quickly but they are there in the Q&A section. Um, Leonie do you want to go we'll just go back in um, the order in which you presented. Sure sure I'll be quick um, thank you Indijit who's not here anymore but um, I guess very broadly um, rather to go into specifics, how, how you define a particular regime will affect the responsibilities, obligations, and potentials for resistance. So I think Indigy is right there. So moving from occupation to apartheid, instead of it being um, a conflict of interest between the um, oppressed and the, the occupied and the occupying force, and so it's about balancing it until you get a peace agreement, apartheid says it's an international crime, we're pointing the finger in one direction. Um, so it does allow for a certain amount of resistance, but it doesn't go as far as, say, as framing the situation as one as settler colonialism and drawing on um, anti-colonial and post-colonial um, ideas, which would say, which would allow greater kind of more extensive resistance towards decolonization. Ending apartheid isn't the same as decolonization. So I think um, Institute's right that there's limits in um, the way in which we frame things and the way in which international law frames things, which is why it's really significant to point to international law and say, are you framing it appropriately such that this violence can be eradicated to the full extent? Um, and just in response to your your um, question, Andrea, I haven't, you know, not for, for not a lot of time to think about it, but I think pointing to human human rights scholarship, I think has that same. Um, dialogue in terms of what human rights can achieve and what they can't achieve and in terms of um, identifying how human rights can actually enable violence and doesn't take into account um, the lived experience of most people in the world. Um, so I think maybe, it and I think whenever we, human rights needs to do more to accept the critical scholarship to really understand um, how violence, um, how human rights can't eradicate the violence in the world. I mean, it hasn't really answered your questions, but I think it's worth looking at that literature um, as part of IR scholarship to understand, um, I think, what you're trying to, to get at. Thank you. 
Um, Ty, do you want to do you want to respond? Yeah, I think it's less a question, more just a recommendation for an article, but I've already made note of it. And I'll definitely look it up because uh, I'm basically looking for anything that helps me think through uh, something as diffuse as atmosphere. So I'll, I'll, I might thank Interjeet separately after this, just to thank it for the reference. So. Thank you. Um, Sashi? Thanks, Andre. Um, I'll quickly respond to Dr. Uh, Vijaya Chamundeswari's question, which is very relevant to what the Indian state is currently doing in terms of formulating new discriminatory national citizenship laws that aims to protect refugees from South Asia, who are Hindus, who might come to India for protection. But it also sends an implicit signal that Muslims are not welcome here because there are other places they might as well go to get to be protected. And this is a perfect manifestation of state power where the ideas of the state is a particular civilizational idea of what India is. And this is resuscitating um, or redeeming the old ideas about what the state is, the transcendental notion of the state, which was slightly hidden, contested, and always going around in Indian circles within the religious establishment, but also among cosmological debates as well. So reviving what debates um, and appropriating it for strategic reasons in order to in order to exercise power is, is a particular way to demonstrate state as a monopoly in the use of force. Um, I hope uh, that sort of answers uh, your question, Dr. Vijaya. Um, I didn't quite get to your second question because Zoom crashed. So I had to like restart it. But um, I think I'll, I'll hear um, after Jasmine, if you if you want to repeat your question, maybe I'll, 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 I don't know if I'll have an answer, but at least I'll know what the question is. Okay, shall okay. I? Thank you. Um, and just to flag up as well, there's another question that's popped up in the Q&A if you want to have a, I don't know if you've got a chance to look at it as well, Jasmine, um, but uh just to flag up, there's another question there if anybody wants to take a, a look and respond to that too. Um, I can respond to your question, uh, Andre, that you asked and um, sort of fold it into an answer that it's a great point, Ben, that you've made. Um, <clears throat> so I think some, in terms of state violence, yeah, absolutely. How or the epistemological lens or the theoretical lens that you approach it from has implications for who's supposed to bear responsibility in terms of the framing and um, it's, I'd go back to the framing of war versus, and this ties in with Leonie's point, war versus are we talking about occupation or settler colonialism? So, I mean, I've been teaching the Arab-Israeli conflict for about 10 years now, and it's whenever I've inherited the module or when it's been listed amongst the modules, it's the Arab-Israeli conflict. And in more recent years, you know, students actually have have noted why, why are we calling this a conflict and been questioning what what how do you define a conflict is that what we're seeing here and that then has a bearing on who you see as the culpable parties who you see as having primary responsibility and offering protection for civilians and what laws you can call upon um so actually when students for example are answering essays they might then go about defining it saying oh by the way this is not a conflict we are talking about the context of occupation and therefore you're talking about questions of it's not two warring parties but you might be reflecting on resistance that ties in with some of the points that Ty is also making in terms of Fanon so that then also speaks to Ben's point about who might be invested in a particular state's um, performance of violence um, and so if there's a sense of there is the, the state has certain powers um, and it's it sits somewhere on a hierarchy between states and civilians and there are other states who are supposed to be enforcing those laws that are supposed to restrain that particular state. Have they necessarily got the interests to do so? And therefore, who's supposed to be representing the interests of the civilians? Even those states who make up the United Nations, yes, it's an international body that's supposed to cover for civilians. Ultimately, they're all states. And then, of course, you have the, the interesting situation historically where a number of those states will ideologically... Um, affiliate with a particular state and its enactment of violence, um, especially if it shares histories of settler colonialism, for example, and fears for if they were to try to apply certain laws against a state that's enacting violence, that there'd be questions about how those laws would then apply to them. So yeah, I think that in some, there are, there are vested interests because there's more parity in, in certain actors' histories um, and 
in terms of the, the contemporary status quo with a state that's enacting violence that then actually complicates whether they're in a position to even apply those laws that we've been talking about. Thank you. I'll just invite uh, Sashi or, or Leone as well, um, because the question was addressed to you too. Do either of you want to uh, come in or follow, follow on from that? Can I just quickly go? I, I, I think um, that, that's a great question, I think, Ben. Um, and in many ways, it also shows the sort of simulation and simulcra environment that we are in. Um, but the only problem which I see is it is not a sort of anti-politics, the sort of hypocrisy with which continuous support of a particular way of thinking about what is the state and how a state should represent a particular way of racial hierarchy, a monopoly of violence and so on, uh, and who to protect and who not to protect, who are the aggressors and who are not the aggressors and so on. It's not an anti-politics, but it is precisely the politics of hypocrisy. And that creates this sort of, sort of tensions between those who want to have an idea of the state versus those others who want to transcend the idea of the state. And uh, it's performance all the way down, but it's also a political performance all the way down. But this is a great question. Thank you very much. I mean, I can jump in a little bit just to add, I mean, I think um, Jasmine and Sashi have really um, have responded really well to that. I guess um, what I've been thinking a lot in with the recent tensions is also essentially the failure of international law, because these states who are coming to the support of um, Israel in its actions in Gaza are still using justifying language. They're not, they are still trying to um, couch it in terms of um, eradicating terrorism and a state's right to defend itself. Um, and I think that's where international, this tension I'm talking about with security versus human rights and security seems to always win and violence always seems to win when it comes to um, the tension between human rights. Um, and also how it's, and I think maybe this speaks to Ty's work of how it's, permeated amongst societies and amongst people and how we're all if we you know if you just look at social media people are very quick to be okay with violence and be okay with violence in different forms whether it's state violence or non-state violence uh, violence for the sake of liberation or violence for the sake of security depending on what narratives you're working we're also tied up with violence that it's not just the state and the state um institutions and um operations it's everybody um and that's um and you know who uh, judith butler who talks about we have to stop the cycle of violence um her you know respond to violence with non-violence uh, non-violence not being passivity but something different um so i mean i guess it's just a, a long-winded kind of reflection on lots of the the kind of um things that are going on at the moment um, but I think human rights have failed and it's not the right language to talk about um, alleviating state violence. And that's the kind of angle I come from um, and whether there's ideas of justice and equality that are nonviolence, which are better ways to to approach our system, our international system. Thank you so much. And I think we're just about approaching. Um, we're just about approaching time for the session. So I wanna thank all of the panelists for such great presentations, um, so thought provoking, uh, you know, a, a lot to, to kind of think through and digest, but really, really interesting stuff and really timely as well, just in terms of how it's kind of fitting into the current political climate. Um, so thank you. And thank you to everybody for coming. Um, thanks, Leonie, Jasmine, Ty and Sashi. Thanks to Terilyn for um, your support as well. And a huge shout out to Kat, Sarah, Joel and Mary from ISA for all the work on the technical side of putting it together as an ISA event and for accommodating our super early start for anyone who's on the other side of the Atlantic. So very much appreciated. Thank you again to everyone for participating.